But let me begin by uh, admitting that I have not worked in this area in several years. Uh, I worked with John and, and Jacques uh, uh, in the, in the uh, mid 80s to mid 90s. And, um, uh, but I'm, I'm very pleased that I was invited to come and talk here and it's been great, uh, inspiring to hear uh, the work that's been done. I, uh, so I will, my talk will be uh, some reminiscences of the work that, and in a review of the work that we did in the, uh, uh, back in those years. And um, I hope that that will be uh, of, uh, of value to take a, a, a casual walk through, through that work. Um, so um, uh, let me just, so set up a little bit of background um, that uh, I, Percy already gave some really, really nice uh, uh, discussion of some of the background of integrable systems, but I'll add a little bit to that. Uh, so uh, I think there was the first heyday for integrable systems was back in the early 19th century, uh, where Jacoby and Leoville and Hamilton uh, spent uh, uh, worked on uh, uh, on solving explicitly. Uh, some integral systems, uh, such as the geodesic flow on ellipses and so on. Um, and in other examples of integral systems, uh, of, of completely integral systems, an integration of those sort of trickled in after, after that for another 100 years or so. But uh, a renaissance occurred in the, in the 1960s with the, um, the development of, of you know, KDV and, and uh, infinite dimensional uh, integral systems for uh, partial differential equations. And, and of course, uh, Peter Lax in the late 60s uh, presented Lax pairs, uh, uh, showing that these, uh, that the uh, integrals can appear as eigenvalues of differential operators. Uh, but also in the 70s, it was, people were also developing Lax pair, uh, just matricial Lax pairs to talk about some of the classical, to, to, to uh, uh, derive, re-derive some of the classical uh, examples from the, uh, uh, from the early 19th century. Um, so we're seeing this lax pair in, in partial differential equations, but also matricially. Um, so in particular, uh, I think this is the paper that maybe Percy had just mentioned. Moser uh, presented work in 1979 at Berkeley, uh, the um, the Chern Symposium at, at Berkeley, and um, and he he wrote he showed that a, a large number of the finite dimensional uh, integrable systems, uh, geodesics on ellipsoid, Rosicatus, uh, and geodesics on uh, SON, uh, can be thought as matricial lax pairs of rank two perturbations of a fixed matrix. Um, so that's my starting point. Uh, and uh, yeah, and he parameterized these, uh, these rank two uh, uh, perturbations with uh, as, as quotients of, of R2n, the symplectic manifold. Um, so two questions that Moser asked in that paper, by the way, uh, I think after Percy mentioned that paper, uh, there was some discussion of maybe we need to look at it. Well, here it is, here's Chern Symposium. So anybody, maybe Alex will, will share that with you later. We'll we struggle with, with your life. It's, uh, <laughs> it's actually, I think it's a really amazing paper. It's, uh, he, uh, it's two papers in it, really. It, he, the first part of it is his lecture that he gave at the symposium. And then there's a paper that follows, well, and then the rest of the paper, which is the majority of it, uh, he gives all the details and, and works out many aspects of, of these interval systems. It's, it's really a, a pleasant, uh, a, a, it, it, there's a lot of interesting mathematics in there and I recommend it highly. Um, and, and in fact, the, the, uh, uh, there are other articles in there too that I, I think are very important. So there's a very important symposium back, back there. Um, so two questions. One uh, that he asks is, can all integral uh, systems be represented in some lax pair form? So we've had some 
discussions about that already. Uh, I think that, you know, that question is still maybe somewhat open, but in terms of what do we mean by represented in lax pair form that we need to be, as, as Percy pointed out, there's lots of things can be represented in lax pair. So we need to specify what we really mean by that. Uh, another question that I, I think is I'll be addressing more is, uh, is there a general reason that the eigenvalues of, are in involution? Uh, so so um, his proof was, very, was pretty computational uh, for his examples, uh, but he does mention some work of Adler that he said shows promise. And uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So uh, where we come in, so that's the, the sort of background. And where we come in is uh, in 1984, uh, it, it was for me, uh, you know, my, my, uh, in my postdoc years, uh, a magical year at, at the Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, John was there also that year. And, um, and uh, I made lots of friends there. and. Uh, and that have been you know lifelong friends. It was a great time. Uh, Emma Previato was also there, uh, and uh, and we ended up working together on on some projects that John had mentioned. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I uh, I'm not sure we all have heard, but Emma passed away this past summer, and so um, it's uh, sad news. Um, but uh, back then. Uh, as I said, it was a, uh, probably all of you have, have spent some time at the Institute, but uh, th uh, this was a, a really wonderful, uh, it still is, I'm sure, a wonderful place to, uh, uh, to do mathematics. Uh, we had, I think, uh, uh, so, so the, there was a great chef in the, in the, uh, uh, for lunch, who provided lunches to us. I think his name may have been Franz, but I'm not sure. Is that right, John? Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, and of course we had occasional chamber music concerts and and uh, afternoon teas with home baked cookies that were just perfect places to get together and talk about uh, and talk about mathematics. And uh, and of course uh, is it also had a bit of a summer camp feel with tennis courts and and, uh, and um, rambles through the woods and so on. Uh, this was, so, the, so that year, uh, uh, so I was, I was early in my career at that point and it was uh, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, the, um, I was probably overawed by, uh, by many of the, the senior mathematicians there, but Luckily, John was there as a few years older than the young group of members, but he uh, he was uh, you know very much more approachable and and he would join us at lunches and and as we all know, John will always uh, has always got some mathematics to share and mathematical uh, discussions uh, to to uh, to, uh, to to bring to the front. And so, um, uh, at, at some point, I, it it came out that he'd been uh, reading Moser's work, and uh, and uh, suggested uh, some some ideas for generalizing it to uh, instead of rank two perturbations of a fixed matrix to the general rank R setting, and so. Uh, he and I and, and Emma Previato uh, uh, started writing a paper in, in 19, so that was 1984. Uh, by, by, the end, by the spring of, of 85, that was our year was up. I think John maybe stayed through the summer, but uh, we, um, uh, so we went our, our separate ways. I went off to the University of Georgia. I forget where Emma went, maybe back to BU or, or Boston. Boston. She went back to Boston. Yeah. Um, and and uh, John went on to, I think that's when you went to Stevens Institute. Is that right? Uh, I did, yeah. yeah. For, one For one year. Yes. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, back then, 
it was a little harder to continue collaborations as than it is now because there was no such thing as the internet. Although uh, shortly thereafter, uh, I moved after moving to to uh, to UGA, uh, John's uh, in, uh, collaborating with John inspired me to to get the math department there to have a uh, email account. So we so we got our first email account. It was a BitNet account, and uh, I th I'm not sure if it was that year or the next year when you were back in Montreal that we started doing some email communications. Uh, uh, but also, I do remember that we're uh, so that we were just learning how to do deal with that. So uh, you know, of course, there's a dial-up modem, and we had one account for the department. So the the uh, we shared it. And the uh, the subject line would say this is a message for so and so, <laughs> and uh, so that was a uh, back in the beginning of all this. We, uh, uh, but of course, so we made some progress there. Also, uh, some very expensive long distance phone calls that my department head would occasionally uh, ask me about, but. Uh, uh, we we managed to keep things going and and I'll, and uh, and at least once I was I, re, I remembered you probably also remember John John and Jack that we uh, we came up we met in uh, in Hoboken near apartment in Hoboken I believe we we kind of uh, as I recall it we were basically locked ourselves into his apartment for three or four days and I'm not even sure how we ate or what we ate but somehow we <laughs> we've just spent. Uh, a long weekend pounding through the paper and, and got a lot of a lot of work done at that. Hoboken was Stevens. Yes, I was actually living in West in South Orange, uh, but oh, we probably uh, met at the office. Yeah. I think we were in your apartment, but I may be wrong. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> but, but anyway, that was a uh, those were the the days of of collaboration on on this, and and then it went on. Uh, uh, we went on to continue with uh, other collaborations. Uh, well, that's uh, so that so Jack was there. That was when Jack moved came came into the uh, John and Jack and I did some uh, continuations of the work with uh, with Emma. So uh, so the work with Emma was the first paper that we that I worked with with John, and um, that was finally published in. Uh, Communications and Math Physics in 1888. And now I'll try to give a little bit of an overview of what, of what that uh, paper consists of. And then we'll move on to, uh, to talk about uh, the later work with, with Jack. So I'll give you some of the basic ideas, uh, but I will, but staying out of the details. So, um, so let's see if I can. So we start off with uh, uh, M and R is uh, are the N by R matrices. <coughs> and if I take a pair of N by R matrices, then uh, F G transpose is a R by R is a N by N rank R matrix. So, um, so this gives us a uh, space of all n by n rank R matrices, and and so if we if A is a fixed uh, n by n, then A plus F G transpose, uh, where F and G are in M and R, are the uh, the um, the rank R perturbations of A. So, um, so let's let me give that that space a name. So, so M A is the set of all FG plus F G transpose, uh, where F and G 
Okay, so uh, so we want to look at uh, so these are rank R perturbations. I want to look at isospectral Hamiltonian flows on this space. Well, Hamiltonian, I guess I need to say something a little bit about symplectic structures. So first of all, uh, well, let me say Poisson structures. So uh, first of all, MNR cross MNR, I can think of as P star MNR. So um, uh, using the uh, trace pairing. And so, uh, so that's symplectic. Uh, so schematically, one can write this, uh, that omega is the trace of E, F, wedge, D, G uh, transmits. And, um, but, uh, so, uh, so there's a Poisson structure here, but we want to think about a Poisson, or a symplectic structure. We want a Poisson structure here. Uh, well, there's a, G act, a GLR action. So if G is an element of GLR, then, uh, then F G uh, comma G, uh, G inverse transpose uh, is, uh, th this is an action. So G, F G, F G goes to, sorry, <laughs> G times that. Um, gives us an action on, on this space. And so, uh, and, and it's symplectic, it's a symplectic action. And of course the quotient, if I multiply FG times the transpose of this, I end up getting uh, FG transpose. So, uh, so MNA is the quotient of MNR, of T star MNR by this GLR action. And so this gives us a, an induced Poisson structure. All right, so now we can talk about Hamiltonian flows on this space. And, um, and then uh, I want to look at how do we get some uh, isospectral Hamiltonian flows on here. So, uh, so to do this, we construct a map into a loop algebra, or some map into a loop algebra. So let me, a little bit of notation, GLR tilde is, it's formal loops uh, of semi-infinite minus infinity with some uh, variable m, I'll say, uh, um, xi lambda i, xi is a GLR. And, um, and, and then uh, this splits into in a subalgebra, so GLR LR delta plus is the matricial polynomials. So that's the uh, so these these uh, loops starting at zero. So summation. I equals zero to some n m x i i i. Sorry. And uh, in GLR minus, are they uh, strictly negative? Sorry.
to minus one. And so GLR splits into these subalgebras, GLR tilde. Um, and so, uh, so GLR is a, so these are infinite dimensional Lie algebras, uh, formally at least. And, uh, and so there's a Lie Poisson structure on their duals. So, uh, GLR plus star has a Lie Poisson structure. And so do, of course, the duals of the, so there are three uh, groups here, or algebras here. And they all have, uh, have duals with Poisson structures. So we, uh, so basically what uh, our, our main construction is that the, the map uh, given from uh, JR, I think we had a tilde in it, uh, MNR plus MNR into GLR. Oh, yeah, I should say, so there's a, well, GLR tilde plus star. So I need to tell you what I mean by, so GLR tilde plus star can be identified with uh, GL R tilde minus using uh, using the residue trace pairing. So we take the uh, the uh, trace of the product of two of these uh, matricial uh, of these matricial loops, and um, and then we uh, take the residue at zero. That gives us a pairing, and uh, and so in the, in the dual of this space can be identified through that residue trace pairing with this guy. So um, just the formal dual again. Uh, we'll we'll be working with finite dimensional. Uh, well, we're working in GLR. Uh, we'll, be, yeah, we'll be working with finite dimensional orbits. So uh, all the formal stuff is not a problem really. Uh, so this map is given by they are f of g is equal to um, GLR. So I'm going to take um, make sure I get this right. Um, I always get the transposes wrong, so I'm going to just check to make sure I get it right. G transpose. A minus lambda inverse F. So I switched the order of the transpose. So now this is an R by R matrix. And, uh, and I can think of this expanding. In, so this gives me a, a negative power series, a Laurent series, negative Laurent series in, in, um, in lambda. So in, in this, in, in this is a Poisson map. So, uh, so this gives us a a map. Uh, oh, and it's it's invariant under the uh, the GLR action. So there's a GLR action that I've mentioned already here, and um, and obvious and an obvious uh, GLR action. On on uh, on coefficients on that side. Yeah, but if you really want to work and just add the algebra, you have to make sure the algebra and the a are inside the circle. Yes, right. Otherwise, you won't have a positive inner space. Well, formally, you can positive the velocity. Right, the right. Have argument and that cannot be thought of as a yeah, but it can A 
with the argument inside whatever the leap circle is. Okay, All right. Thanks. Yeah, please feel free to uh, to correct me. I'm going to. I am trying to, uh, you know, not get into too many of the details. There will, there will be lots of places where I'm going to avoid that uh, because uh, otherwise, you know, I'm trying to give an overview of things. So I'll be speaking poetically at times, uh, but um, but please uh, point out some of those some of those details if you feel necessary. Um, yes. So uh, this gives us a. Uh, so this, since it's invariant under the GLR action, we can think of this as a map uh, from uh, from uh, M A into GLR. So this rank, the space of rank R perturbations. Well, actually, yeah, sorry. I, let me state that. Uh, no, okay. Guess I really want to think of that more in a functional sense, but we'll get to that. Again, poetically, I'll say that. <laughs> Let me be more precise about that. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so here's a a, a moment map uh, or a Poisson map. So, um, so now I'm looking for some uh, isospectral Hamiltonian flows, and and so here's where that work of Adler now comes in. So, Adler uh, and uh, and also Costant and Symes independently. We're, we're during that time in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, we're, we're looking at, at Lie algebra splittings. We're showing, seeing how to, uh, that, that the, how the ring of invariance on a, on a big algebra that splits can, will give rise to commuting uh, Hamiltonians on the dual of the subalgebra. Uh, so, um, so basically, uh, that the picture there is that, uh, yeah. So, so the picture there is that you have some Lie algebra G, which I write as a as splitting, and um, and the invariance invariant column invariant functions on on G star invariance when restricted. So this gives, uh, say, L star can be uh, if having a, if I have a, an inner product here, then L star can be identified with, uh, with the annihilator of, of, uh, Okay, and uh, and the invariance uh, on on G star restrict to uh, commuting. So the invariance they obviously comm commute on G star, but when I restrict them to to L star, uh, restrict to commuting. Uh, but non-trivial now. The invariants give trivial flows, uh, but they're now, now often non-trivial Hamiltonians on, on uh, L star. So here we have that situation where we have a splitting of that loop algebra. And, um, and so we can restrict the, the invariance on the big loop algebra to the dual of the of the smaller one, and get uh, and get commuting flows. So those invariants, well, we are basically the coefficients of the uh, of the determinant. So, yeah. 
Trace, Trace, and Barry. And so, um, well, so I guess in some sense, the main theorem of, of that paper with Emma, AHP, is that with this construction, we can pull these, these commuting Hamiltonians back to our MA, our isospectral perturbations, and get, um, and get isospectral, uh, sorry, our, our rank R perturbations. We'll pull it back to the MA, the rank, space of rank R perturbations, and we'll get isospectral uh, flows there. So, uh, so this family of, so let's see. So I've got these, this family I G star uh, restricted now to L star. And we, uh, and uh, we pull them back. So now I get JR star. So I'll take phi and psi. And here they commute in the L star bracket, uh, but they also, um, when I take JR star of phi, uh, the Poisson bracket here, they, they continue to commute. Uh, but now, now they're non-trivial uh, Hamiltonian flows. So um, uh, the theorem is that these are isospectral. So, so the theorem that these flows, these commuting flows are isospectral. And the proof is basically the uh, the equality of determinants. So this uh, the determinant of a plus f g transpose uh, minus lambda as identity is equal to the determinant of a minus lambda times identity times the determinant of um, of I plus G transpose A minus lambda inverse. So there's JR of F and G. So here the the coefficients in lambda of this of this are are, uh, are these invariant polynomials. And now I'm pulling them back with JR. And we're seeing that the uh, trace determinants of this n by n matrix can be given as linear combinations or sorry, polynomial uh, combinations of the trace determinants of the right-hand side. And so the, uh, uh, so the, yeah, so the trace invariants of the left-hand side are functional combinations of the right-hand side. So since they commute, these commute. And then they're in their G invariants, so we can bring them down to them. Those functions are G invariant, so we can actually think of them as functions on the quotient by GLR. Um, so uh, that's the main idea of that paper. And uh, now that paper was about 50 pages long, and that's after the editors forced us to reduce the size. Uh, very painful. Uh, but uh, so there's a lot. So that's page. Uh, there's a lot more into the, in that paper, so it's about 50 pages long. And uh, so there are examples where we uh, show how we can represent the Moser examples here, and also uh, representing uh, uh, finite dimensional solutions to uh, MKDV and KDV and uh, CNLS. Um, so there are uh, uh, several examples of that sort. There, um, there are also, oh, the, the, so all of this I've mentioned in terms of uh, GLR, but uh, so there's a, a lot of, a, a long section where we 
we do reductions to, to other classical algebras. Um, the other classical groups. So we get lot, lots of uh, lots of details and hard computations and these things. Um, and also, uh, we showed uh, well. There's a connection to a spectral curve, and uh, and and we can linearize on the Jacobian. We outlined that uh, that procedure and. Um, and, and in, in a special case where A is, is diagonal uh, and the, uh, well, and the eigenvalues have a certain multiplicity, so there's a special case, we, we proved complete integrability. We did the, the appropriate dimension count. So, uh, so after uh, so, so that's that's kind of that first paper, and uh, so after that, uh, Emma went in separate direction, and she was working on other things. So uh, Jacques uh, Hertevis came in, and um, and we we uh, have a few more results since then. So uh, AHH. So the the first paper we wrote is is a continuation of. So the first paper is a continuation of, of, of AHP, where basically we work out this, this final point in full detail and full glory and uh, in no special cases uh, and, and, uh, and understand the spectral curve, finding the right, uh, the right way to, to uh, to embed this uh, spectral curve in, uh, you know, find a non-singular uh, embedding in in P, in some uh, um, uh, line bundle over P one. So, uh, so this, uh, I, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail about that, uh, but. Uh, Oh, what is the spectral curve? I should have mentioned it here. The spectral curve is, is basically. Oh, I've got a third board. All right. Uh, that's actually, I'm going to do this because end up covering that. So the spectral curve. Oh, well, here it is. I uh, just set this determinant equal to zero. Oh, you need sorry, I need a, yeah. Sorry, what? You need Z. Yes, I need Z, All right. So it's not quite there. Let me write it down. That's not a curve that was what I had there. So the, the uh, spectral curve, let me write it in this form. It's, it's the determinant, it's the other side of that equation. A minus lambda times the determinant of G transpose A minus lambda inverse F minus Z identity equals zero. Um, So we found the appropriate the appropriate embedding, and uh, uh, H -H. Uh, is there, so is there a convenience in leaving this factorized for because I mean then so this it, makes it a polynomial. Yeah. Okay, but it, then it becomes also a uh, oh no okay so. mm -hmm. and uh, yeah and I should I guess I just erased it but. Uh, just you know, emphasize that this is an R by R determinant, 
whereas we started with an n by n matrix. And so there, there's a relationship between this n by n determinant and the r by r determinant. So uh, yeah, so here we uh, you know worked out worked out de details. Uh, details of the linearization in the algebraic geometry and, and you know a good embedding or the right embedding embedding the spectral curve. In a rolled surface, that gave us appropriate dimensional uh, uh, well, it, it, it allowed us to to get good counts of the of the i of the uh, numbers of integrals to to get uh, uh, proofs, general proofs. General groups of complete integrability. We want to talk about it. I've got a few minutes still. Yes. And a couple of other uh, results that came up. That, that, that we had following that paper that I think are some of our other key ideas. And, uh, so there's more to this. So the next paper with, with the three of us, um, H2, I'll call it, is on uh, what we call duality. I think it appeared in 1990. And um, uh, so it, it relies on this following observation is that if you look at the determinant of this big block matrix, A minus lambda um, minus F G um, Y minus Z, that's this determinant, but just by looking at row reduction, you can rewrite this as the determinant of A minus lambda uh, times the determinant, determinant of, um, of I plus G transpose A minus lambda inverse F. So there's that factored form. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I can say there's a Z somewhere. There's a Z, yeah. <laughs> uh, where's the Z? So I want a, sorry, I want a um, Y minus Z here. Y minus Z. Looking at the wrong note here. Yes. And uh, and but. I can switch the roles of whether I'm looking at a minus lambda or y minus c. So this is also the determinant of y minus z as the determinant of, and probably a minus lambda, a determinant, determinant of a, well, <laughs> one determinant is enough, a plus uh, f, A plus F Y minus C inverse minus lambda. So G, so G, G transpose. Uh, G transpose. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> minus what I need, lambda. Yeah, so. Um, so there's, uh, we can look at, we can think about these isospectral perturbations of, you know, for if setting uh, Z equal to zero and Y equals one, we're back to our 
earlier um, uh, situation, but uh, so this gives some generalizations that we can sort of put a little twist in that rank R uh, perturbation with the Y thing. Um, but it gives, so it tells us that there's a spectral curve for this N by N matrix. And it's the same as the spectral curve for this R by R matrix. So uh, I don't know that, so the, the role of the, uh, of the eigenvalue, so uh, you know, here the eigenvalue is lambda and now the eigenvalue could see. Um, so you can think of it as an R fold cover or an N fold cover, depending on. Now, when we talk about rank R perturbations, R is usually less than N. So the, the other version is, you know, full rank type perturbations and is bigger than R. Question is here. So is, is the, how, um, if I give you just the polynomial relation between lambda and C, is it possible always to write it in this form? Uh, like a determinant of this bigger matrix, right? I wouldn't know. Sorry, what's the question? If, if I give an arbitrary polynomial relation between lambda and Z. So it's just a general can polynomial. It, can it always be? P of lambda and Z. Can I find a? Can I find a? A, a, a y, f, and g? That one? Yeah, but it, I mean, this, the point is you're getting a curve that should be sort of k-sheeted over the lambda line. Well, I mean, that, that's the polynomial. And minus k sheeted over the z line in some yeah. reasonable way, and then you can probably describe something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can express my relation by a lot of them. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. So, the, so it's, is, is every curve a spectral curve? Is that kind of. <laughs> well, I mean, in some sense, you can always. Some reverse engineers. Some reverse engineers. Yes. It, the so, answer is yes. And not only yes, but infinitely yes. There's a huge degeneracy as you choose the information because you're approaching it. So you're throwing it a lot of redundant information. So well, you can already see the degeneracy. But there certainly are children. But in, in, uh, you have to look at the uh, at the partial fraction expansion of these black structures. And you look at the, uh, you look at the rank signal numerator, you look at the degrees of the denominator, and the degrees of the bottom. You take all that data, there's a lot of it figures, and there is an optimal way, one optimal way, to reconstruct that structure. You're using just this data. But you really need all four of these A, Y, F, and G, and you can't. Immediately uh, say what the dimension of, I mean, the N and R is also a variable. Starting from P. Right. From the you start, you start with, uh, the spectrum. Start with a with a P lambda Z, okay. which is uh, polynomial in Z and rational in lambda, which is what you have. Right. Uh, with a uh, certain degree of polar divisors, which is that well. Then you can reconstruct, you can, you can find at least one. Right? I mean, um, F, G, Y, and Z that give you that as yes, a right. So, yeah, so this is, uh, so we call this a, 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 some, a, a duality between these two integrable Hamiltonian systems and worked out lots of examples and, uh, and so on. To, uh, but it, that had somewhat already, some of them had already uh, shown up somewhere in the literature that uh, uh, certain tops and so on had N by N versions and N rank two versions. And so uh, this kind of brought that together as a unifying unif unifying idea. Uh, and then finally, the, the last, uh, so we actually had a, a number of papers, I think, uh, uh, is nine or ten papers altogether that John and I were involved in. Uh, most of them were also with Jack, uh, but one was with Emma, and I think maybe we had one that was just John and I. Um, but I, I think another main, the other um, important result that comes out of these, uh, maybe there are lots of other things too, but the ones that stand out to me at this point after 
not thinking about this for many years, uh, was a, a paper in 1993. Uh, where we uh, uh, that we found our separating Darboux coordinates. Uh, separating Dar Darboux coordinates for these integral systems. Separating. So, not exactly, uh, well, not quite action angle variables, but uh, but certainly uh, enough to be able to uh, to solve, you know, to write down solutions in terms of quadratures and, and so on. Uh, so separating that read coordinates. Um, so uh, the, the general idea here is, uh, well, let me look at, so N of lambda, an element of, of this uh, GL R tilde minus, this dual of the, matricial polynomials and oh I should check my time. I started a little late. All right. Yeah. Another five minutes. Another five minutes. Okay. Um, so and I want to find Darboux coordinates on on the co-joint on the co-joint orbit of N of lambda. So there's this orbit O n lambda is cojoint orbit. And uh, we'll let L of lambda be uh, well, I'll, I'll turn it into a polynomial by getting rid of the rational. So n of lambda has to be one of these rationals. So n of lambda is J of F G, say. For some fg, then uh, in, and so I've got this a that's running around in here, and uh, that's the determinant. So I'll just write that determinant of a minus lambda times n of lambda. So now I have a polynomial, uh, and uh, and the spectral curve uh, for for any n of lambda on that same on that on that cojoint orbit, I get the same spectral curve. Didn't want to do that because now I've covered it over. But it's... so the general idea is that on the spectral curve we have a line bundle uh, that by these uh, these Hamiltonian flows they're they're linear on the Jacobian, um, and so in order to get these uh, separating Darboux coordinates, basically so that. Uh, that eigen line bundle, so that line bundle is the line bundle of eigen vectors, or, uh, and um, uh, is that we look at, you can think of this as a function on the, that, that you can think of the, the, the divisor of that line bundle as a function on the cojoint orbit. So, uh, and so explicitly, if you let uh, k, k of lambda, the be the um, the classical adjoint matrix uh, of L of lambda, uh, and where's my z minus z times identity, and um, then you can. Uh, uh, and and let v zero be a eigenvector uh, i guess l zero uh, uh, constant part of l and uh, then k of lambda z equals zero so the solutions So lambda i z i uh, plus on commute and separate the so you can you can basically uh, 
explicitly write down these uh, commuting variables on the co-adjoint orbit that uh, separate these. Um, Jack looks concerned. Did I write it down wrong? I said I'm being poetic. <laughs> oh, oh, did I? I meant. Lambda I Z I. Yeah, I need a. There's a there's a V zero here. Sorry. And the Poisson bracket maybe is a delta J. All of the columns are linearly are proportional on the spectral group. Yes. So this, so this guy is rank one. Is rank one, and so. And what you really look at is the section of the body, which means the component of that. Yes. So, right. so that's why I multiply by this yeah. vector. Yes. Sorry, missed that. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think I should end there. Yeah. Thank you very much. But well, it's a comment actually. There, there's uh, this. This means explicitly what it is is you're computing the divisor corresponding to a section that you know integrable systems. So the curve plus a line bundle on the curve. Okay. So you're computing the explicitly the coordinates of a divisor corresponding to that line bundle. And this this extends to a whole bunch of, of uh, more general things, the, the Hitchin systems, the Stianin systems, and a whole bunch of things that, where you've got a spectral curve sitting inside basically a Poisson surface in a natural way. And so your your integral systems. And, Basically, a symmetric product of the Poisson surface. And it's very amusing. The original calculation for this was something totally heroic that John did over I don't know how many pages. And it's, it's, you know, only his uh, sort of uh, ardor uh, would have pulled it through. And then as time went on, I was doing it to other things. The proof kept getting yeah. much more abstract, but shorter and shorter and shorter. Until it's so, basically this. <laughs> until it disappeared, yes. We did this thing, and uh, it was quite an effort. Uh, what that system that uh, Malcolm was indicating, it amounts to a pair of solving a pair of polynomial equations. And of course, in general, to solve a pair of higher degree polynomial equations is not something that you can do explicitly, except in very rare cases. But what we didn't realize, but somebody else, Michael Geckman, realized, was that you can rewrite these two polynomial equations as a one polynomial equation alone, plus an evaluation of a given polynomial. Two very equivalent, but his way of doing it. Uh, it was still a question of solving higher degree, but not two of them, just one of them. And that really, I think, was a very uh, valuable uh, insight. And he also, which we missed, but then it became obvious what he also did was we were doing this always with a so called linear, I mean, how can we use the R matrix language? But it's a, it's a linear R matrix Poisson bracket. There's an absolutely trivial way in which, I mean, it isn't trivial. Michael found it, and we realized that it was uh, sort of obvious what you look at. We go to exponential coordinates instead of Q and B's, we go to E and Q. And then you get another Poisson bracket, which is related to the linear bracket, but which is quadratic. And you have the same spectral Darboux coordinates, except that everything is in exponential. And so you can do the same thing for uh, Poisson groups, not just Poisson the algebra. And so that that was, I want to give new credit to to uh, my director. Yeah, that was idea of standing up. But but that was a beautiful indication uh, and generalization, which we uh, which after we built them, which, that was your insight. So I have a question, but it's not my question. It's Percy's question. I'm just re-gifting. So now having seen this, I see a lot of similarities between this and. Uh, Wilson's paper on the clodro moser particles in, in terms of the Della Grassmannian. So is it a coincidence, or is there some way to take the uh, Captain Kaufman's Sternberg description of clodro moser matrices from 1978 and see it as a rank one special case of this? Who were you asking? AHH. The 1983 version. I don't have anything to add to that. I have something to say that is not a satisfactory. 
way, way back at the time that we had our side spectrum functions. And I realized that it was a superficial similarity between the duality. That's what I was, as he was speaking about that as well. Yeah. And, and I got some formulae for bispectrality from George Wilson's paper, which very much resembled some of these. And it's in the write up in the proceedings of that country. I didn't solve the problem. There was a, a link that was missing. I can't remember exactly, but if you're interested in knowing what possible relation is between this and George Wilson's stuff, have a look at that article. Um, oh, yes, I can ask it also. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now, it, it usually there is a procedure, right? So if I give you the polynomial equation, the spectral curve, and the divisor of the degree G plus R minus one, Something you can like reconstruct uh, one form of the last matrix. Now, the question is the following, what additional information thinks is completely A, F, G, and Y? I don't think that you have to have just one divisor, probably you need two divisors because you need something relative to well, the A and Y are, are invariants. Yeah, but the F and G. The F and G, there's there's a it's in the paper actually. You, you can describe it algebra geometrically. It's, it's sort of the evaluation of certain sections. Three points are not too fast. A few rules. The point is that the lax matrix is an operator, but as Jacques observed, we can create that operator by just taking sections of the line model and multiplying it by a given mirror model picture function, which is the eigenvalue. And so up to a choice of basis, you can reconstruct the lax matrix. No, but I, it just, I don't just want the lax matrix. I want exactly all of all the information in F and G. The F and G, yes, you can. And it's, it's, so it's encoded. Without any... It's basically you have a space of sections of a line bundle. You've got a certain number of points of where you're evaluating okay. those sections. So no additional information. But aren't they, doesn't the GLR happen? Up, up to the actions it's of the behavior. Uh, this okay. makes it very simple. Either the y is zero or there's just a constant term y. But in general, you could have a whole of n degree of infinity. But that's trivial. Infinity is the same as any other point is complete democracy in the one. So if you want it explicitly like that, you will also have to do a, a Linear fractional transformation of the spectral parameter to get an arbitrary pool of infinity. But aside from that, which is really critical here, is throw out arbitrary pool of infinity. You don't lose it. Then you can see and do it. So, then I, next question, right? Because the isospectral deformations of the lax matrix are uh, L dot equal L commutator. Uh, can you write the isospectral deformation directly for the big matrix? That depends on lambda and z. Well, in principle, you should be able, right? Because they are called they are do a sort of bispectral bispectral <laughs> isospectral <laughs> bi <laughs> bi yeah, so. probably. Uh, actually, maybe not. You know what I'm thinking? We um with 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 these uh quivers and everything. You can reconstruct the lax matrix in the combinatorial way. Yeah, in some cases, uh, yeah. We had what you're looking at is the what is it? Uh, something transformations. You got this input and output. Yes, yeah, yeah. boundary measure. Boundary measure. Yeah, well, you, you, you realize well, this is all, you, you, you realize this is a picture of like a we were a network with a torus, and you can. Or well, you can cut torus by this into a cylinder yeah. or like that into an annulus, and that results in precisely this formula for boundary measure. Right. right. So that that is probably the closest to using the, the big thing. Yeah. That, yeah. that that guy is somehow a little bit of boundary measure. The, the big one. Yeah, but I wanted the isospectral deformation of that. The boundary, the 
boundary measurement matrix doesn't go any well with that. No, but that's, yeah, that's not part of my question. Yeah, well, if you, what, what you do then, the deformation is your problem. When you just, the problem network doesn't change to the boundary, right? But again, imagine you have a, a cylinder, you cut a piece of it, and you do it at the other side, and that's a suspension because it's just discrete. That's discrete, 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 discrete but right. that, that's exactly yeah. Love it. Yeah. 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 Taking the torus, turning it into a cylinder, and then recreating a torus in the opposite way is exactly what relates to two dual lines. Mm -hmm. right? but, 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 but the actual boundary measurement matrix, which is, I guess, the bigger one, that doesn't do the role of ISIS. Well, it has to be a spectral because the spectral curve is constant. Yeah, but the spectrum of that guy yeah. is not constrained. Yes, well, not all that guy was in the DC so. Why should it? But it's the same spectral curve. It's a conservative. So, no, the, the characteristic polynomial yeah. of that. Oh. Uh, no, no, but, well, I'm, I'm, I'm calling the spectral the thing that. Uh, I mean, but on this big matrix, but it's a matrix, it's a pencil of matrices, right? It's not, it's is not. Is there any reason to think that the, that is just a determinant? Yeah, yeah, but it's a pencil. To, if sure. you equate that determinant to zero, that's equivalent to both of the right. rules. But it's a pencil of matrices, right? It, seems, it feels like there should be some structure on the big matrix that sort of yeah. gives rise yeah. to everything yeah. else. That what it should be able to say it all. You can write down equations in certain directly. They don't look like that kind of matrices, but they, they do involve a uh, quartic Hamiltonian, which is FFGG. Uh, but that doesn't show that that's a linear system, but that doesn't. I mean, it's not. It's, 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 a, it's a direct way to write the Hamiltonian equations in terms of a quartic Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah, something. But I don't think that the spec, I don't see why the spectrum of that matrix should be different. Just oh, or maybe yeah, just the determinant, just the yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But you can put lambda equal to z. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it? Okay. Yes. Uh, 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 common. I mean, this may be totally from left field and maybe totally wrong, but I heard input and output. So, yes. in control theory, mm -hmm. people look at matrices like that one. And maybe the question, the early question, can any curve, any P lambda Z, Z be represented that way, may have some bearing in control theory. Maybe there is something there. Nobody was <laughs> looking for that. And yeah, there was pole placement problems. Yes. And pole placement problem, which. Yeah, uh, that and some, I mean, go back to Walker and Cry. <laughs> Okay, I think we have exhausted all possible questions. Let's thank the speaker again.